I wish I could be there with you all in person to see your lovely faces. Um, I give you my greetings still from uh, Midwestern United States, where I'm starting up uh, a new laboratory for nano optics. And I have to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak at this workshop. Unfortunately, I had a run-in with a nanoscale nemesis, uh, which we're all nowadays acquainted with. Uh, but nevertheless, I'm really delighted to still be able to share, at least by Zoom, some of the uh, research highlights for the past couple of years. And a lot of the results that I'm going to show you here today uh, were acquired in the past couple of years uh, in uh, under supervision of Dmitry Basov, in part at Columbia University and also part at uh, back in UC San Diego. And it's, uh, I must say, it was not planned, but it is rather fortuitous that Alexei decided in the previous talk to discuss about uh, nickelates because uh, my topic for today is um, along these lines a bit, particularly where we might find nanoplasmonic signatures in metallic and correlated oxides, even if we're not looking for them. Um, and this has a great deal to do with both the amplitude and phase response. So let me first say, you know, give a, give a one slide um, depiction of um, cryogenic imaging apparatus technologies, which uh, Dimitri has also discussed a great deal about, as has Frank and, and Alexi. But suffice to say that uh, the results I'm going to show you here today were in no small part uh, uh, enabled by a home-built cryogenic uh, nanoscopy system that's been in operation since 2017. Here are some photos of the apparatus as it sits or sat in at uh, Columbia University about a year ago. And, um, and my forte has uh, long been the examination of uh, correlated phases at low temperatures in these oxide materials, for example, V2O3, neodymium nickelate, manganites, and the list goes on. And I could spend all day discussing with you about the origin of morphologies and the characteristics of the uh, electronic phases that manifest during these phase transitions. Um, but I'm going to tell you about a different topic today. And I also would like to flash uh, some of the key personnel going back years who have really enabled this, uh, this, this technology and the ability to do these studies at low temperature. Uh, of course, uh, my, my former supervisor, Dmitry Basov, as well as some very, very ambitious and, let's say, crazy uh, graduate students who, um, in years past, I had the pleasure of undertaking what seemed like an impossible uh, uh, technological challenge of, of implementing near-field uh, microscopy at low temperatures, and it has since sort of paid paid dividends. And nowadays, I'm the one who's learning from the rest of you uh, how to uh, uh, bring this technology into the next generation. So I won't say much about neodymium nickelate because, fortunately, Alexi has already done that for me. But some of the images that I'm showing you here are from our publication a few years ago. Um, in, in nature physics, but suffice to say, these images were taken on thin films as we go through the insulator metal transition, this compound at 150 Kelvin. So um, I want to draw particular attention to the what's going on at the domain walls between insulator and metal. And um, of course, for these, for these materials, the temperature is a tuning knob that can trigger the energetic balance between a low temperature ordered phase, which in this case happens to be an insulator, and the, the parent high temperature Fermi liquid phase, which is a metal. Um, so these domain walls, uh, first of all, in this material, which is so close to my heart, are very intriguing because the boundary between insulator and metal is uh, um, um, very, very broad on the scale of hundreds of nanometers. And one way of indicating this is simply to take some line cuts across small bits of debris or what have you on the surface of the material, showing that we plainly have you know, 30 nanometer space resolution. And yet some of the uh, uh, electronic phases and their spatial extent is in, in uh, much in excess of that sort of length scale, indicating that we really do have some sort of intermetallic response that lingers at the boundary between insulator and metal. Why is that interesting? Well, there are claims of new physics at these domain walls, uh, particularly by Dobrys Slavievich and, and company who have uh, done theoretical studies on the non-Fermi liquid characteristics of uh, the electronic phase of this intermetallic boundary, the possibility of uh, frustrated spin liquid, and a variety of other intriguing um, characteristics that can manifest here. So my question is, what are the electronic properties that are emerging at these domain walls? Now, as we well know, um, near-field microscopy has the uh, fantastic ability to scrutinize the optical response at small uh, you know, nanoscale um, uh, dimensions. And we typically think of the near-field signal as probing some sort of local reflectivity which we can probe at a variety of different energies simply by tuning our laser to the requisite energy. And these images happen to be at 100 milli electron volts. But uh, what is not 
as often as it should be given uh, attention is that we have access not only to the amplitude of this optical response, but also the phase of this optical response. And here I show you just the selection of images of insulator metal domains where you can plainly see that although the amplitude response shows some either a binary characteristic, either I'm a metal in, in indicated in red in this false color map, or I'm an insulator in blue. Although that seems rather dichotomous, in the near field phase, we see a, a host of more subtle and interesting phenomenologies. In particular, if we look very close to one of these insulator metal boundaries, we can see um, what I'm going to go ahead and call a fringe in the near field phase. And um, now this is sort of anomalous, but in a somewhat different context of nanoimaging, these fringes are rather commonplace. And uh, this different sector of nanoimaging that I'm referring to is particularly the, um, the preponderance of near field studies of polaritons. So um, to go a little bit further in this talk, I have to give at least a one slide um, summary of what we need to know about polaritons. Here I snapshot a picture from a popular review um, highlighting the taxonomy of different polaritons that can manifest in van der Waals materials, ranging from plasmon polaritons, which we know well about in the context of graphene and maybe other uh, metals and two-dimensional semi-metals like black phosphorus, as well as potentially in, in superconductors, ranging all the way to magnon polaritons and magnetic systems, and uh, also phonon polaritons, for example, in HPN or in MO3 or in, in many of the other materials that have been discussed already in this workshop. And these polaritons are characterized by this sort of non-local response, um, which means to indicate uh, whether we can or cannot excite one of these modes. The answer to that question depends not only on the energy at which we're choosing to excite the material, but also on the momentum at which we're choosing to excite the material, giving rise to these dispersion diagrams, of course. So we know well about the possibility of manifesting new polaritons by hybridizing these van der Waals materials together. But I just want to highlight, for a pedagogy's sake, uh, the uh, case of single layer graphene, uh, for which we obtained images uh, a couple of years ago down at low temperature indicating the ballistic propagation of these plasmons and high mobility graphene. And the only things we really need to know, um, we can still consider some sort of reflection coefficient, but now it's a non-local one. What do I mean by non-local reflection coefficient? Well, it's, of course, one that has a dependence on the frequency as well as the optical connectivity of our material, but also on the momentum at with which we excite it, this momentum Q. And, you know, you can uh, do some mathematical games and massage these sorts of relations into one that looks like a response function with a strong pole and a plasma uh, momentum or a polariton momentum. So here we can typically, with near field, probe with very high momentum fields, uh, um, of order one over the tip radius, which I'm going to write A here, is pretty high momenta, capable of exciting these polaritons. And most importantly, the resonance condition we can well describe by a plasma momentum, which can be parameterized in terms of the two-dimensional connectivity. It's pretty straightforward what that means for graphene. But I want to highlight here, uh, this formalism works perfectly well as well for quasi-two-dimensional metals, for which we have some finite thickness, for which we have a plasma frequency. And in this case, uh, we can devise a plasma momentum, which we might expect to excite a polariton resonance in quasi two-dimensional metals as well. And most importantly, the quality factor, which we can at least in principle deduce by measuring the dispersion of, of a polariton, either in graphene or a real 2D material or in a quasi 2D material. The quality factor is described, at least in the case of plasmon polaritons, by the ratio of the frequency to the frequency dependent scattering rate. And this is very important for correlated electron materials to get some inference of the lifetime of quasi-particles. So this is a very important factor, and it's actually encoded in the polaritonic response of a uh, 2D metal, whether that 2D metal be graphene or whether it be an oxide. All right, so let me, let me go ahead. We want to test these ideas in a quasi-two-dimensional metal and look for the, for the plasmonic signatures to inform us uh, what we should really be looking for in correlated electron oxides. So let me start with a very boring material, uh, uh, perhaps one of the most boring vanilla metallic oxides that we can come up with. And we're going to ask the question, can we investigate and uh, understand and also control plasmons in, in, a, in a, uh, a metallic oxide? So this material, MO2, has been uh, characterized with electron energy loss microscopy previously. And polariton modes have been identified in this, in this uh, rather simple um, oxide, this metallic oxide. 
And these are sort of visualizations by electron, uh, electron energy loss microscopy of the actual distributions of the plasmodic field at energies that are, of course, relevant to our imaging with SNOM. So our collaborators uh, uh, delightfully grew uh, microcrystals of different uh, dimensions, ranging from hundreds of nanometers to uh, upwards of 10 microns. And now we have to think what we expect to see. Um, we had to readapt our sort of uh, uh, plasmonic um, uh, formalism to the context of confined geometries, where we don't expect a continuum of different plasmonic excitations with uh, continuum momentum, but instead discrete polariton modes that in some way can be excited with our tip uh, when combined give rise to an overall image that, uh, uh, that, that, that we can see. Now, of course, the plasmon momentum is similar for a 2D metal as it was for our graphene. Here we have the permittivity and we have the thickness of the metal and we have the permittivity of the surrounding environment. These are all small modifications. We sort of consider all these plasmonic, uh, discrete plasmonic modes. We can resum them to make a prediction for a given plasmon uh, momentum uh, as to what the plasmonic image should look like. And the important thing here is that the smoking gun of plasmonic signatures, according to this prediction, should lie in the imaginary part of the phase response of our near field images. And here's such a prediction right here for one of these two dimensional metals. So what do we actually see? Here's the uh, uh, nano imaging results for the near field phase. And what you can plainly see is a, uh, a, a sort of a pattern that evolves uh, depending on the size of the microcrystal that we're considering here. So here I reproduce that formula for the plasma momentum, and we can start to map the dispersion of these, of these plasmons, not only by looking at these MO2 crystals at different energies, uh, where the substrate screens differently, depending on whether we're imaging at one frequency versus another. We can also tune the thickness of these crystals. As we make the thickness larger, we expect the plasma momentum to go smaller, the plasma wavelength to grow. This is, in fact, what we observe. And accompanying these images, we have our theoretical prediction, um, and the input of which is simply the optical conductivity of this, of this metallic oxide. Moreover, if we change the screening environment, throw it onto silicon, for example, a high K material, we can change uh, very strongly uh, the plasma momentum, and we get a nice prediction of, of what the um, plasmonic pattern should look like in the near field phase. So everything appears to be working so far for a quote unquote boring metallic oxide. We can even ask the question whether metallic oxides and plasmons therein can play the same games as uh, plasmon polaritons and van der Waals materials. One question we might ask is what might happen if we attempt to hybridize the plasmons in, in uh, quasi two dimensional oxides like these with uh, phonon polaritons of adjacent materials like ionic solids. And what we would naively expect to happen so you put on my, my Hamiltonian cap and I can sort of solve what are the collective or the normal modes of my combined system. And what you sort of expect to find is a mode splitting if you have strong hybridization with, a, uh, with an adjacent mode. And the strength of this, of this mode splitting is something that we can quantify by doing nano imaging or nano spectroscopy. And this mode splitting is often called the Rabi frequency. Now the question to ask is, um, you know, what's the relevance of this Rabi frequency? It has been, let me go back here, it has been um, uh, highlighted as a potential origin for triggering new phases of matter if one can only achieve extremely strong coupling between collective modes, for example, a plasmon and a, and a phonon, and has been implicated in engineering, for example, enhanced superconductivity or spontaneous ferroelectricity and so on. So the context of this strong coupling between polariton modes is a, um, a storied one and a very important one in the condensed matter community. Now, let's ask the question, what can we attempt to hybridize these metallic oxides with? So one favorite material is molybdenum oxide, which I won't dwell on because I'm, I'm certain it was covered in great detail in former talks here. The key point is that the dispersion of phonon polaritons in this uh, hyperbolic material depends on the orientation of propagation as well as the energy at which we choose to excite the polariton. So depending on whether we're exciting at band one, band two, band three, by energy, the phonon polariton modes will propagate either along one zero zero direction or along zero zero one direction and so on with a hyperbolic dispersion. So uh, isofrequency contours can become quite complex, but let's focus for a moment on this, uh, this, this uh, second band. And what we're going to attempt to do is hybridize a plasmonic, uh, an, a, an oxide plasmon uh, to uh, this this phonon polariton mode in the in the type two band here uh, around 900 wave numbers. 
So what happens? Well, basically what we're doing is we're throwing these crystals on top of MO3 substrate, and we're looking to see how the plasmon is modified. So one can image in the near field amplitude all day long. A metal looks very bright. Um, we see the polariton modes in MO3. That's all well and good. But the real subtlety lies in the near field phase where we can see these plasmon modes in the uh, metallic oxide quite clearly. In particular, if I zoom in a bit here, you can see that there is a small fringe, which I have to highlight with a pink line here, which is dispersing uh, anisotropically, particularly along the 100 direction when we have this MO2 crystal on top of the MO3. And so um, imaging at different frequencies is one tool to map the dispersion. Another, of course, is nanospectroscopy. So here, of course, we're doing nano-FTIR measurements in the context of this MO2 plasmon coupled to the MO3 phonon uh, below it. And what do we, in fact, see? We can do this nanospectroscopy measurement along two different directions, along the vertical direction where we expect the hybridization to be weak, and then along the horizontal direction where we expect the hybridization to be strong, because that's where the phonon platons are permitted to propagate. So along these two directions, we see dramatically different dispersions for the plasmon. And again, these are nano FTI results strictly in the near field phase, where these signatures are really most evocative. Yeah, I, and what we can see here is we have- Alex, yes. sorry, you need to, to finish soon. Speed up? Yeah. All right. So we are, what we observe, yeah. all right, so I'll, I'll finish up here. What we can actually do is map the dispersion of these hybrid uh, polaritons, and from our nano FTIR results, go ahead and put our data points there. And we can see we have a very strong Rabi splitting between these two modes. It means to say that uh, plasmon polaritons and oxides are can be just as evocative as the uh, as the plasmon polaritons that we're more accustomed to, let's say, in graphene. So where are these where are these plasmon polaritons in other oxides, particularly correlated oxides? I just want to give you one example. In the context of VO2, where we can trigger an insulator metal transition, nucleate these little metallic droplets, we see hot spots in the near field phase. And for a time, this was puzzling until we have now the context of these confined plasmon modes in oxides. And uh, depending on the um, size and shape of these, of these different metallic droplets, the near field phase pattern can be quite evocative and quite different. So what we can actually do using our machinery, we can collect some images of amplitude and phase of these metallic domains. Using our machinery, we can actually enumerate the fundamental modes associated with metallic domains. And we can make predictions about what the imaginary plasmonic response should be. And there we see a nice agreement with our experimental data. What this means to say, and I'll skip over that, is that plasmons are alive and well inside of correlated oxides. And in particular, um, this lesson of fringe patterns that show up in, in potentially plasmonic oxides is something that goes back years to, uh, for instance, I want to compare it to a 2007 results from uh, Andy Huber under Reiner Hillenbrand, where they investigated the plasmonic response of semiconductors, and where you can see a strong uh, dependence of both the amplitude and the phase response, depicted here in this polar plot, uh, tracing out these sort of uh, uh, circular orbits. And as the amplitude response changes, so does the phase. And these are sort of smoking gun signatures of plasmons, which are hiding everywhere under our nose and even in these correlated oxides. So this uh, approach to using near field phase to scrutinize the optical properties of these correlated oxides uh, must leverage very strongly uh, the uh, reality that plasmons are alive and well inside of correlated oxides. So I just want to conclude here, and I'm, I apologize for going over time, but the key point is that the phase of the nano-optical response can really pinpoint even strongly damped polaritons, especially in correlated electron materials. And this is going to be a strong um, tool uh, for future examinations, which I have to highlight are really going to depend on the next generation light sources, including cryostoms that hopefully will be developed in the next years at synchrotron infrared facilities giving access to the whole energy range relevant for uh, phenomena and correlated electron oxides, as well as the next generation of tabletop lasers. And I'm very delighted to announce that uh, in my own laboratory, uh, the system shown here has been installed uh, only a couple of weeks ago and interfacing to the next generation of cryostoms, uh, uh, tool sets uh, for, or photon factories like these, if you like, is going to be the task for the next couple of years. Um, of my nano-optics endeavors, including going into a magnetic field. So I do apologize for going over time. Maybe there's time for a few questions. And here I acknowledge all the folks who put in a great deal of effort to make the studies that I've shown you here today uh, possible. And uh, with that, I'll conclude. Thanks for your attention.
Thank you, Alice.